Well, it doesn't say on here, but I am actually in from Vermont and um, was impressed with your snowfall here. We have about the same amount back in, uh, back in Vermont. Um, so captives, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about small captives. Jeff's going to talk about group captives. And uh, if the captive idea wasn't exciting enough for you, uh, those letters after my name mean I'm an actuary. So they thought, let's really juice this up and send an actuary out to talk about the captive concept. So hopefully uh, there's enough coffee back there. Um, I should be well caffeinated. So we can go through this pretty quickly, or we can go through it slowly. Uh, as we go through, please ask a lot of questions. Um, it's a concept that needs to be, and maybe a few of you in the room have actually discussed small captives, 831B captives before. Uh, but please do uh, interrupt. We've got, I, at least on my side, have plenty of time. We can spend a, at least an hour on this concept. And um, we should be able to address some, some real life um, issues or questions that you, that you have. So we'll talk about a few things on this. Um, in particular, uh, the actual 831B election, the concept, the economics behind why you would do it, uh, absolutely the insurance reasons why you would do it how we do it, the process, all those kind of things. But we can also informally talk about the do's and don'ts. If you Google search 831B, which is the small captive concept, if you Google search 831B, you'll get a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of returns that are unsavory. Uh, there's a lot of consultants in the space who, who are doing some stuff that you shouldn't be doing, and, and which is really, really angering the IRS. So, we can spend some time on talking about what you shouldn't do, which is, which is pretty important from our, our perspective. But as I said, I'm in, I'm in from Vermont. Uh, my role is to do these sort of events. I'm a captive resource within Marsh McLennan Agency, so I work with uh, RJF and, and the other uh, agencies throughout that structure across the country, working with clients and prospects to determine whether or not a small captive is a, is a good solution. Um, so I know many of you are colleagues in the audience, some of you are prospects, clients, so uh, if there are some things uh, during the conversation that may be a little too uh, personal to your business, we can certainly talk um, offline at the end or, or set up a time later to discuss specifics about your company. So with that, let me grab the clicker. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on Marsh. This is, this is sort of the, the grander Marsh. I am a Marsh McLennan agency um, employee, again, working with the agencies across the structure. However, I am a liaison within the Marsh group. And the Captive Solutions group um, falls within the grander Marsh structure. So maybe that's more than you need to know. But point is, is that uh, working with Marsh McLennan agency, working with RJF, you have access to Marsh's Captive Solutions Group, which is the largest captive consulting and captive management firm in the world. Bigger, not always better. However, working with a firm that has the most captives, that means we have seen the most. We have done the most. And in the captive space, it really is, seeing, it is about seeing a lot of different coverages, a lot of different industries, uh, a lot of different domiciles for which to put your captive, uh, working with more service providers than anyone else across the globe. Uh, and specifically in the U.S. So 1,250 captives, that number is worldwide. Uh, of interest within, <coughs> excuse me, I'll hold the mic away. Uh, within Marsh's Captive Solution, there's, there's primarily three areas uh, that are of relevance. Captive advisory is the consulting arm. That's, I'm an extension of that. So does a captive make sense? Does it not make sense? How do we go about structuring a captive, feasibility studies, and so on? The actuarial area of which I used to be a part, uh, what are the premiums, what should the premiums be within my captive? What, how much uh, reserves do I need to hold to ultimately pay claims? And then cap finally, captive management, of which that is the vast majority of the colleagues, are the ones that run the day-to-day -day operations of your, of your captive. And I can answer a little bit about what those folks do, because sometimes that's a, that's a mystery. I've got the, I, I created this captive, that's all fine and good. I know why I did that, but what the heck does this thing look like on a daily basis? And we can get into that if time allows as well. So, small captives. A captive is a captive is a captive. And what I mean by that is when you create a captive, it's the same legal structure, whether it's small or whether it's large. I mean, there's, very, there's differences in, in, in solution type and, and how we actually execute that. Um, but, but primarily, <coughs> 
the captive that you might fall for, uh, uh, create for your middle market company is essentially the same as a captive that Coca-Cola or IBM might, might create to retain the, their corporate risk. And that's exactly what a captive does. It funds retained corporate risk, all right? So uh, a, a plain vanilla example of a large traditional type captive would be um, the workers' comp, general liability, auto liability, <coughs> deductibles of a parent company, funding those into a captive. That's, that's the sort of the, if you went through the 1,250 clients that Marsh has worldwide and you had to generalize, it would be a big company with large deductibles on their work comp, general liability, auto, that they fund those deductibles through the captive. Not everybody looks like that. Almost no one will look exactly like that. Um, but from there, uh, th that's a starting point. Maybe it's a, a drug company that does product liability. Uh, and then from there, we look and we'll look at some of the, the nuances of a small captive. But in general, both small and large will do this. The fund retained corporate risk could be a means to access reinsurance, less so on the small captive side. Profit center, certainly both the large and small side, uh, and must satisfy risk transfer and risk distribution. That last point we'll spend a lot more time on. It's a little bit more technical. Maybe that's a 200 level course or even a 300 level course, but that's critical. You can be a captive technically without satisfying risk transfer and risk distribution. And those, those, those uh, phrases are really specific uh, and relate to the tax qualification of your, of your captive, making sure that it's an insurance company for tax purposes. Um, you can have a captive that does not take a tax position, and there are a, a good number of those. I'd say about 50% um, of the book of business that Marsh has that manages on a daily basis doesn't take a tax position, meaning they don't deduct the premium when they pay it, and they don't get to deduct reserves within their captive or make the special 831B election. But it's important when we talk about small captives that we think of them as a larger captive with really strong insurance purposes. As I said a little, a little while ago, there's some do's and don'ts. Well, the don'ts are forgetting this slide and talking just about the tax benefits. That's the don'ts, all right? You can't, you can't create a captive and, and the main driver be tax. So when I say small captive, I'm referring to 831B captive. Now, 831B is a section of the tax code. And the reason we like to refer to it as a small captive rather than an 831B captive, which is the commonly used phrase, is that you cannot create a captive for tax reasons as the primary driver. So why the heck would you refer to it by the line of the tax code? So let's not do that. Let's call it a small captive. But it's a small captive. It's a captive that in the IRS code says this. If you're a property casualty insurance company, risk distribution, risk shifting, or risk transfer, we'll, we'll discuss that in a bit. If you can show us that you did that, and it's small, meaning you, you take in the captive actually takes in premium annually of a million two or less, then you can choose to make this election. And the election says, if you make the 831B election, you're choosing to only be taxed on your investment gain. So think about a captive for a second. It's an insurance company, or it can be. And the primary business of an insurance company is underwriting insurance risk. Premium comes in, pays losses, pays expense. At the end of the day, the primary business there is you have an underwriting gain or an underwriting loss. This election says that your underwriting gain won't be taxed. Okay? If you make the 831B election, if you have underwriting profit, profit due to the main business that your, your captive is involved in, you're not going to be taxed on it. Your investment income will be taxed, but that's typically white noise. We don't, no one's earning 20, 30% on their investments in the, in the captive. So step back for a second and think about this. If I create a captive, my company creates a captive, uh, and we'll talk about what you can and can't do or how that you actually get to that point. But if you create a captive, and, and it is an insurance company for tax purposes, 831B says this. Write a premium check from the parent company to your captive insurance company. That's a tax deduction because it's a premium payment to an insurance company. Okay, just like any premium payment you would pay to a commercial insurer. Now, that's the same of any captive that satisfies risk uh, shifting, risk distribution. Now, under the 831B election, if I write very profitable type business, so a very simplistic example is an earthquake policy. It may not be relevant, likely not relevant to your companies, but. Take an earthquake policy where I bring in money, let's say it's a million dollars, I bring a million dollars into my captive, at the end of the year, didn't have a quake. Wonderful, that's all underwriting profit, minus expense of running the captive. That's not taxed. If my company was profitable, 
we, uh, if it is profitable, and had that premium not flowed to the captive, it would have been taxed. I've taken, in this example, a million dollars. Instead of being taxed on it at the corporate rate, or if it's a sub S or LLC, whatever the, the, the rate at which it would be taxed outside the captive, I don't pay that if I put it into a premium form, put it into my captive, and if I don't have a loss, I don't even pay tax on the underwriting gain. All right? So I have, and if I don't buy this earthquake policy currently, I can write a million dollar policy, take a million dollar deduction, put it in the captive, and in a year where there is no loss, that's all gain, not subject to tax. Go another year, same thing. I write another million dollar policy, no loss, lovely tax benefits, tax deduction, underwriting gain, no tax on it. And I'm essentially saving, in my example, maybe $300,000 in tax. I do that year after year after year, bam, year five I have a big loss. And I wrote a $2 million quake policy. Well, now I gotta pay out $2 million. We set up the cap so that you have $2 million between capital and the surplus and the retained earnings of this. The idea still works when you have a big catastrophic loss like that because now, absent the captive, I would have paid for that with my own money out of the, out of the corporation. Now with the captive, I've had four years of underwriting gain and tax efficiencies that tax essentially I didn't pay by building up this fund of money inside the captive and now I can pay the, the earthquake claim likely with roughly a million dollars of tax efficient dollars plus another million dollars to pay the two million dollar claim in my example. That's the idea. We'll go through some examples of that, but I wanted to just put this into perspective to tee it up as we go through. Does that make any kind of sense? Or if it doesn't make sense, speak up. Yes? But there's got to be some sort of exposure, right? I mean, so we can do like a million dollar you know, earthquake policy here in Minnesota. Correct. That's why it's a bad example, but it's a very simplistic example. So we have to have real live risk. So, you know, the tsunami insurance in Kansas, that's an example of the nonsense kind of stuff. Uh, someone brought up uh, to me about a month ago that they had a client who attempted to write a key employee, a key person policy in their captive. They didn't have any employees. It was an entity with zero employees, so nonsense, right? I mean, it's hard to explain that. So this is why when the IRS is out there looking at, there's a lot of abuses of this because this is great. I can shelter a ton of tax. But this conversation needs to have, needs to take place with your insurance broker, okay? Needs to take place with your insurance consultant. And then a captive consultant like myself comes in and, and joins the conversation, all right? Someone in the room with you needs to be able to talk to you about what are my real risks? What are real live insurable risk? And we can, on the captive consulting side, say, hey, business risk versus insurance risk, um, those are do's and don'ts. So, an insurable risk, an example insurable risk could be the quake if it's a real live you know, peril. Uh, a business risk might be um, reputation risk. You might be able to buy that in the commercial markets. If you write a reputation risk policy that is going to replace income, that could be arguably be a business risk. Uh, an example, a real life example, we had a, a year ago we had a prospect who came to us and they were commercial real estate developer and ultimately holder of the real estate and rented um, they made little strip malls, like little, the, the stuff that you saw coming in here today. And then they would rent out to Starbucks and or Caribou Coffee and uh, Verizon Wireless and so on. They uh, ultimately said, uh, Marsh, we don't want to use you. We're going to use somebody else. So we said, fine. They, they, they were trying to get something done in a week, and we just thought that was nonsense. We couldn't do it. They came back to us a month later, the CFO did, and said, hey, take a look at this. Um, we're not, I don't think the consultant we hired did a good job. And, and when we looked at it, it was chock full of business risk. Uh, and the, an example would be, they own these real estate pieces of real estate and they rent them out. They, law, they wrote into the captive a loss of tenant policy that was triggered by the tenant just leaving. It wasn't a default of payment, which is insurable. So I, you know, I couldn't afford to pay my, my uh, monthly rent and therefore it shows up as a bad debt on the, on the uh, commercial real estate owners uh, balance sheet, what they did is they said basically if a tenant up and leaves for any reason whatsoever and we lose income, the captive policy comes in. Well, you have to step back and say, well, why did that tenant leave? Well, I don't know, they left because we never, you know, turned the, you know, we, there was a leak in the roof and, uh, you know, there was, we never cleaned the sidewalk. We were bad landlords. That's a business risk, right? If you had control over it, it wasn't fortuitous, bad, it's a, a business risk. So that's the kind of stuff we have to stay away from. So to your point, it has to be a real risk, has to be an insurable risk, and then the, the third criteria is you have to charge an appropriate premium for it. So 
Maybe you could write a quake policy for a company in Minnesota, but the premium is going to be almost, you know, almost nothing. It's de minimis. Okay, so those are the those are the three criteria that get us to where we need to go. How, how literal are they? In, like, you use the term property or character in your Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so what they're trying to avoid there is life. Um, no life policies. And health to some degree. So we can write, on the health side, medical side, we can write some medical stop loss. The issue on the health medical side is more ERISA. Anything that is um, under the... Uh, uh, the uh, overview, I guess you could say, of ERISA, anything that would be monitored by that, um, you need a Department of Labor uh, approval in order to, to write that into your captive, and that's a big, big to-do, expensive, blah, blah, blah. But essentially, stay away from the health and medical, with some exceptions, stay away from life, and, and you're good. Anything on your property casualty, liability, anything that's on your current summary of insurance that's not life or, or medical is, is likely okay. Okay. So this is an example. <clears throat> if we take, think about that, let's go back for a sec. If we think about this, all right, how do I use this idea? I, I, I get it, the quake, blah, blah, blah. How do I use this idea? Well, the most economically efficient use of this idea, there's a lot of things you can do, and then there's some stuff that you would only want, you would want to do. You, what you can do is you can write anything in this that's not life and, and not a business risk. But would I want to take my first dollar, I got a guaranteed work comp program, would I want to take my work comp and put it in here? No, you wouldn't. We're not necessarily, the most efficient use of this isn't to replace commercial coverage. You can, and maybe that's sort of a stage two or three, but what you're really looking to do is to create insurance. And I don't mean create and make it up, but, well, I don't buy DNO. Okay, let's put it in your captive, because that does a couple things. It provides us good, solid insurance. It creates a premium, therefore creates a tax deduction. We haven't bought it in the past because we don't, it doesn't keep us up at night. Therefore, I'm not going to have a ton of claims activity, likely, on an annual basis. It runs at a loss ratio of 10% or so. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to help me have the tax efficiencies of, these, of the criteria of high severity, low frequency, where I have underwriting gains in more years than not, and therefore tax efficiencies. Uh, what else don't I buy? Well, I might not buy stuff within my deductible layers. I might not buy an excess layer, exclusion to existing policy. So um, property policies, for example, might exclude or have a sublimit with flood or with quake, uh, or there might be some uh, named storm exclusion, uh, anything like that. Um, hail, whatever uh, issues around here with hail might, might come into play. Um, cyber, I don't buy cyber. Supply chain, well, we, this is increasingly a big issue in my business, supply chain. I don't even know how to buy that. What would I do? Well, let's look at your, into your captive intellectual property, patent infringement. Let's look into that. Um, a, a common uh, policy that we're writing into captives these days is an exclusion in your EPLI policies. You have, if, you, if you don't have an employment practices policy, that's something you might think about putting in. Uh, if you do, there's likely an exclusion for wage and hour claims. So you, you know, someone accuses you of, of um, cheating them out of overtime or treating them as a salaried versus hour, hourly employee. Class action suits, very expensive. Insurers don't want any part of it. Um, very expensive in an exclusion, perfect for a, for a small captive. Why? Because it, one of these policies or one of these risks that you're not going to get dinged every year. You're not going to have two, three, four, five thousand dollar claims all over the place every year. If it hits you, it's going to be a big one, likely. It's very expensive. So again, step back. If we're a profitable company, let's find risk that we are on the hook for already, my wage and hour example. Um, I don't buy it, but if I have a claim, I got to pay for it. It's my risk. Let's quantify a premium for it. Let's go out to the market and say, hey, markets, what would you charge this? Well, we would charge roughly $100,000. Okay, let's ballpark that. Use our actuaries, ballpark the number, fund it into a captive, take a tax deduction to do so, and then at the end of the year, if we don't have a claim, we've got some great tax efficiencies there. Okay, so the whole idea is look at retained risk that your company has. If you don't buy insurance for it, you're on the hook for this anyway. Let's quantify a premium. Let's put it into your captive. Fund, it's just a formalized mechanism to fund risk that you might ultimately pay a loss out on and get in a tax efficient fashion. And this is where we look. This is not 
you know, we get creative based on the, um, the particular industry. The limitations here are, are exactly what we've been talking about. It has to be an insurance risk, not an, an, a business risk. Here's a bigger, bigger list. I keep some things on here to talk about uh, that we wouldn't necessarily do, but kidnap and ransom. It's a good one, right? So um, it was actually within this hub that I was with a, a prospect, uh, a client, an RGF client last year. And uh, the guy asked, well, what about kidnap and ransom? And you know, you don't want to make light of it, but he's like, well, are you really kidnap and ransom worthy? You know, is someone, otherwise this is going to be a, a nonsense uh, kind of a policy or it's not going to cost you any money. But looking through this, any, any questions on anything on this list? Not exhaustive. We can certainly get more creative than this. Uh, yeah. Who said that? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, so in a, in a current uh, situation, don't have builder's risk or have a big deductible on the builder's risk or have limited amounts of builder's risk, what would the example be? Um, any or all? Let's do, let's do large deductible. Okay. So large deductible on builder's risk. So what we would want to do in here, if you think about it again, the tax benefit or the efficiencies of the 831B election are that you have underwriting profit, right? So what we don't want is a year where we create a captive, we put premium in of, say, a million dollars, and at the end of the year we have $800,000 of losses. Because it's just dollars in, dollars out, the tax efficiency, there's going to be money cost to, to run the captive. Your underwriting profit is very tiny, and therefore the tax savings is very tiny as well. You want, it's not that you can't ever have a loss. My earthquake example, you absolutely can have a loss and have this economically work, but it has to be that in more years than not, you have very low loss ratios, very little loss activity. So anything we're talking about with the deductible, let's say you got a $100,000 deductible on your bill's risk. Maybe it's a 50000 Maybe that's more realistic. Um, we would look at the loss history, okay, of the particular client and say, well, you do have a lot of nickel and dime stuff. You got a lot of stuff in the zero to $5,000 layer. Let's write a policy to buy down this deductible, but not all the way to zero. Let's buy it down to $5,000. So now that's more, we've taken this, this layer, we've made it more of the severity and taken away the frequency. That's how you'd craft the policy. And we can, it's a good point because in the captive space, we can craft the policy any way you want. It's your captive. You can exclude, you can include, you can uh, you know, write whatever deductible you want. Um, you can get very creative. Because these are the, the types of risks that you're, you can't get necessarily in the commercial market or you're trying to change some, some availability in the commercial market. Yeah. Your list here doesn't call out, call out uh, product liability for life science, but I know you mentioned that for pharmaceuticals. Sure. So for medical device, pharmaceutical, is product liability an option? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the things we want to stay away from, again, life, can't do that. Uh, business risk, that's clearly not a business risk. That's an insurable risk. Um, we, we might want to stay away from work comp, not just because of the frequency. We can do it, but uh, we could do a deductible reimbursement within a work comp. So if I had a high deductible, I could buy down sort of like my builder's risk example from a second ago. But to do standalone work comp, your captive is a non-admitted insurance carrier. That means it's not really recognized by the state insurance department. Only the captive division in the state in which it's created. So let's say... Minnesota doesn't, doesn't form captives. So let's say you went to Montana. Uh, your captive would be a, an admitted carrier in Montana, not in Minnesota. And in order to write workers' comp, you've got to be an admitted carrier. So you'd have to go out and get a fronting arrangement, meaning you'd have to say, hey, AIG, could you really issue the policy on our behalf for work comp? And we'll, just re we'll take all the risk. We'll reinsure everything. Uh, but that adds a layer of expense that's going to kill the economics of this. So another thing you'd, you could do but wouldn't want to do is to, is to have to front. So workers' comp, we try to stay away from. Could be a deductible buy-down. Uh, but anything, like, anything else that, um, that you could you typically buy commercial insurance for, we can. And, and then the questions are, what would we want to? And then the, the, the product liability, absolutely. That's a, that's a common spot. So let's look at some economics of this. And again, I, I say you've got to focus on the, on the real insurable reasons here. Well, that's a unique in, uh, conversation to everybody in the room. So we are focusing a lot on the tax advantage here and the economics behind it. But you know, the beginning conversation is, do you even qualify? Do you have risk? And do you have insurable needs? With that in mind, let's look at some of the economics behind this. So um, 
ballpark, these are ballpark numbers, but typically it costs you about 50 grand to start up a captive. And what that includes is there's a feasibility study. We'll talk about that in a sec, but every captive needs to have some sort of defense for creating a captive. Why did you, why the heck did you do this thing? Well, uh, here's my nice feasibility study that outlines exactly why I did it, what I put into it, uh, who it's insuring, all that kind of stuff. There's a cost to that. There's regulatory costs. There's actually the incorporation costs. So there's, let's ballpark 50 grand. Ongoing, you got to manage the captive. So a state, let's say you went back to Montana, and Montana said, yep, we're going to let you form a captive here. We think you're a great candidate. We like your feasibility study. You're all, the application looks good. You're great. However, we're not going to let you manage it. We're going to let you own it. We're not going to let you manage it. You got to have a licensed or credentialed or accepted captive management firm in the particular domicile to run the, run the business. Uh, there's annual taxes associated with it, blah, blah, blah. 80 grand, let's say. That's probably on the high end, but let's say it's 80 grand to, to run the thing. Now, uh, if you write a full million to a premium, which is the max you can write in one of these small captives and still get that election, that, that nice tax election, let's assume you have a 5% loss ratio on average. All right, now some years you might have 100, 200% loss ratio, that's fine. Again, my quake example, as long as you survive for four, five, six years with very little loss activity, then the fifth year you can have some, something blow up. That's, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I've assumed a 5% loss ratio here. So you got, you got some amount of loss. In a lot of cases, those losses would have, you would have paid for them anyway, right? Because these are, most of the policies you write in here are gonna be your retained risk. So I, I had a, a, a quake with or without the captive, I gotta pay for it. All right, so if your captive takes in a million two, pays out, for, this is a year one view, just a year one view, pays out 50 grand to start it up, pays out in the first year, 80 grand to run it, pays out 60 grand, of expected losses, you are have an underwriting income of just over a million dollars, for which it will not pay tax to the tune of four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so that's a sort of a net look. Now, a net net look would be well, great. You, you're trying to dupe me here, though, because now I've incurred startup and annual operating costs that I would not have incurred had I didn't have the captive. So take the after-tax value of that of, say, $80,000 and subtract that from the four hundred. dollars And if you can max out at a million two and these assumptions come, come true in the first year, you're looking at a net-net at a net tax good of $320,000. So you've taken risk that you already have, you've applied a premium to it, put it in your captive, and you've saved to the tune of taxes of $320,000, year one. 50 grand goes away in year two, and then it gets a little bit rosier. So it's real money. And this is, this, it shows you why, well, geez, I, if I have a lot of retained risk or sufficient retained risk, why not fund it in an economically fee, uh, uh, advantageous way? Questions? Yes? And so are you going to do one of these for kind of parent companies that you can't do wait an hour and well, from a policy perspective, we would want a nice, well-rounded program. So we would write um, typical small cap that might have six policies in it. So it might write cyber, it might write wage and hour, it might write product liability, the, the deductible or SIR. You know, let's say I got product liability with a million dollar SIR. And that's commonly an issue that we see is like, well, the commercial markets are really hosing me on the product liability. Um, I used to have a $200,000 SIR, and then it went to 500. Now it looks like the markets are forcing me to a million dollar self-insured retention. I don't like to stomach that. Well, you might be able to stomach it if you can use this as a funding mechanism. So six policies, say, you know, more or less, and each one of them has, you know, worth $50,000, $100,000 that aggregates to some level of total premium, for which would be one captive. Now, to answer your question, can you do more than one of these? No is the short answer, but you can if it's, in order to do multiple cabs, we get the question a lot, ownership has to be different and there has to be, or significantly different, and there has to be a business reason. What's your business, the feasibility study points out your business reason for creating this captive. If you have two, well, why do you have two? Well, I have two because I have 1.2 deductions, great, 2.4 is even better, right? Well, that's not a great reason. So the IRS would say, you know, if you have a simple C corporation, owning one captive and then create another captive, the IRS would look, well, it's got the same ownership, same tax return, let's aggregate them. Really, you have $2.4 million of premium. You're not, you're not even allowed to take the 831B election because you're over the $1.2 million limit. Some folks can get, you can get, if you have a, an example where it could work, let's say you have a, a company with two owners, and this is a real life example. We had a, a, a firm that had two owners, they formed a captive, 
One owner is 51%, the other's 49. They have their, they're in the construction and then also in the in design. They have two kind of arms of the business. So from a business perspective, they could create two captives with different risks and they could have different ownership because there was two partners with no, no kind of cross-pollination there. All right, so it gets complicated. The short answer is no, and you're getting riskier by doing that, but ultimately you can if you structure it right. Yes? So I have a two-part question based on this hypothetical. Say you're a company and you want to um, make a, what I'm going to call a single parent captive. Mm -hmm. We'd be talking mainly about a single parent captive here, yep. So a single parent captive, we, we create a captive above us, and our goal is to have high deductibles shoved into this program. And so you've got that 1.2 million premium reference you made. Yep. Can our deductibles be over 1.2 million? Yes, only, we're only, the 1.2 only uh, applies to the amount of premium that you pay from parent company to captive. It could be, you could write a $100,000 policy for a $2 million limit. You could write um, a $500,000 premium for a you know, $250,000 limit if it's a lot of activity in that, you know, if the aggregate loss limit is a lot higher than that. So the, that is simply a premium number. So you could have six different policies that all have million dollar deductibles, right? Absolutely. So, um, and we often frame this as a, a starter captive. So the conversations for creating a larger captive. Well, let's step back. What you you, you form a captive, a, a larger captive, we'll say, uh, with you know big big entities, um, because it is a way to fund these retained risks. Again, I have my large deductible work comp, GL auto, and whatever product liability, whatever it may be. Um, and I want to fund it into a captive in a nice, organized, clean fashion that allows me to, every year out the door goes $3 million of premium, and the captive handles the financial volatility of whether claims are high or low and, and whatever. Uh, it improves risk management and that I've got a separate income statement, balance sheet, separate entity. Uh, it improves the focus on, claim, uh, on loss control because, again, this is a separate entity. And then there are some financial reasons to, to do it as well. Uh, access to reinsurance, so I can't, you know, my, my product liability, it's a, product liability is always a good one because it can be so unique. I, I, my product liability exposure is so high. Um, I think if I funded some of this through the captive, there might be markets that are available as reinsurance markets that I can then go to directly uh, as a captive. Um, let's do all that. Well, the reasons to form the big one can also be reasons to form a small one, but those conversations on, the, on creating a larger captive can be complicated. And typically where they're big, with bigger organizations and they're like, well, a lot of the benefits here are touchy-feely, right? They're like, well, I could form this. I think risk management will improve by forming a captive. The pure tax advantages of a large captive are not that I can, don't get taxed on my underwriting gain anymore. The, the tax advantages of a large captive are I deduct the premium I pay into it and then but that's now income, taxable income in the captive, unlike the 831B, it's taxable income. The benefit there is that I can deduct loss reserves. So for example, if I have a million dollar or $500,000 uh, deductible on my work comp policy now, and every year I have, I'm a big company, a lot of employees, and I have $3 million of work comp losses in that deductible, I pay those losses, claims as they come in, and I can deduct as I pay them from a tax perspective, right? If I form a captive, I cut a premium check to the captive. Um, the captive says, all right, in this particular policy year, you had um, $500,000 of losses that were actually paid out. However, the actuary says that due to, related to this policy year, you're ultimately gonna have $3 million of losses. So you can deduct all those reserves that you hold within a large captive immediately. So it's a timing issue. With the captive, I can deduct losses that, even though I, you know, someone hurt their back this year, they're gonna be getting paid over the next 10 years. I can deduct that whole stream if I'm an insurance company. If I'm not, and I just have a deductible that I retain, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I can only deduct it as I get paid. Point is, timing difference for tax purposes, financial benefits not nearly as great as a small captive. Conversation gets complicated. Risk manager can't get on the same page as the CFO, as the owner, drags on and on and on. Okay, pump the brakes. How about start small? Let's do everything under a million two. Let's do sort of these high severity, low frequency risks. 
Let's see here, you can see that there are real economic benefits. Everybody can get on board to do this with the understanding that once you create a captive, you've got the captive. At the end of 12 months, I can take the policies in here, I can just let them expire, I can write six, seven, eight, two new policies. I can um, write, rewrite the same policies, I can change the limits, I can do whatever I want. Subject to that $1.2 million limit, but that's just a tax election. Once you have the captive up and running, you could choose next year, if you wrote a million dollars this year, you could choose next year to write $5 million of premium and suddenly become a large captive. So we've said, hey, pump the brakes, let's, let's, you're getting caught up in this large captive idea. Let's start small. Let's start with the small captive, the 8th term B election. There's great economic benefit to do so. As your company grows or as everybody gets on the same page, we can change the purpose of the captive because you already have the captive structure. Okay? Now there's some tax issues that are get more complicated as to how you become an insurance company, but we'll, we'll punt that for now. Yes? Well, not necessarily. So there's a couple things you can do. There might be a best practice, might be if you're going to totally revamp and do some you know, wildly different things, it might be um, wise to document that and do essentially the living version of a feasibility study, which we would call a strategic review. Otherwise, the state may not require that. It's a, it could be a simple business plan change. Say, hey, CAPTA's already up and running. Say, in Vermont, for example, we would send an email off to the state, uh, the captive insurance regulator and say, hey, we want to suddenly put uh, a high deductible work comp policy in here. Okay, you're going to have to show us some pro formas. With that particular example, you're going to have to have the actuaries let us know exactly what the premiums are, um, but it might be a modified sort of application, and it's a much more simple process than if you did it at the beginning. Anything else? All right, what else we got here? Feasibility study. So the feasibility study is really the documenting the business reason of why you created a captive. What does that mean? Well, what, what decisions are to make? Well, let's look at your company. Let's, in the case of the 831B of the small captive, let's find those risks that you retain that you don't currently buy insurance for. Let's look at, do you have a high self-insured retention on your product liability? Do you have a deductible on your builder's risk? Do you buy cyber insurance? Do you buy, do you have a wage and hour exclusion? Are you in a flood plane and therefore could use some more flood insurance? What are the, the, what areas can we find that are real live risks to your entity? Let's find them. Let's quantify premium uh, using an actuary and going out to commercial markets and getting a feel for what those commercial rates would be so that we can look in the mirror and say these are reasonable premiums because there's it's in, in the uh, captive owner's best interest to inflate that premium to get a bigger tax break. Let's do it with you know the straight face test. Um, let's talk about domicile, which we're going to create this captive. Let's talk about ownership. Let's document who's going to own this thing. And ownership is flexible as well. It could be directly the parent company. It could be a subset of the shareholders. It could be a trust to the benefit of heirs. It could be key employees. You can get very creative with the ownership, as long as your business reason is good. Uh, let's look at the cost consideration. There's some tax considerations. Now, we're not tax consultants, but we can point you in the right direction. We can tell you what we see, and then we can say, hey, go talk. If it's really complicated, we can go, you know, go talk to these folks. Investment considerations. Um, basically, everything you need to know to make a decision whether to implement the captive. So we're going to run you through the, what we call the captive model, which shows you the economic output of this much premium, this loss assumption. Here's your economic benefit. Okay. You then say, let's go, let's do it. Then we get you through the implementation process, or anyone would for that matter, which is simply filling out an application in the domicile, in my example from earlier, Montana. Utah is a popular place, South Carolina, Vermont's a popular place. Let's fill out their application. We'll walk you through that process. We'll help you do that. Um, you're going to pay some taxes to get started up. And then you're created. You're going to need a, a, an attorney to help you with the legal documents to actually create the entity. But there are folks who do this every day. We bring in all the service providers who do this every day, all day long. Uh, it's a pretty turnkey process once we get through the, are we big enough? Do we have enough retained risk? What is that retained risk? What is it going to cost? What's this captive business plan going to look like? Actual creation is there's some work, but it's, it's a turnkey process. <coughs> okay. How long does it take? Well, it's usually 30 to 90 days for the feasibility study. Depends on the time of the year. This is the time of year where there's a lot going on. Everything gets done really quickly. We always advise, if you're going to investigate this, um, let's do it early in the year, assuming you're a 1231 tax year. 
because it's seasonal and everyone tries to shove this thing in at the end of the year because if you do, what wasn't a, a hot topic at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year becomes a hot topic because, oh, guess what? I kind of like this idea, but you know, I got other things to do. Suddenly I find out I'm wildly profitable this year. My company's wildly profitable. If I create the captive by December 31st and fund the premium in there by December 31st, that entirety of that premium is tax deductible in this tax year. So there's some obvious seasonal motivations to get this done. Um, we say, hey, we, our client base is a little bit less driven by that because we are coming to you through your insurance brokers typically and there's a, more, there's a stronger insurance drive, less focus on the tax, more focus on getting it done right. Uh, but be aware of that. We like to, you know, as best we can work in the middle of the year or beginning of the year. Okay. That's, we good on time? Where'd Toby go? Anybody know? Because we can, I can, I can drone on about the pros and cons of this thing. Um, what time do we have? Someone have a time? Quarter after? <coughs> Um, first of all, any questions on, on anything? So this is the time to, to throw up any kind of question you got. Yeah? So to really take home the tax benefit, you've got to be able to take profit out of the capital. So a good prospect um, is profitable because if you're not profitable, there's no tax efficiency in funding this risk, right? If I'm creating premium, putting it into the captive, but I'm at a loss, that didn't do me any good. Um, I've got to have enough cash flow. What I, what I didn't mention up here is every state you go to to create a captive, you're going to have to post capital because they want some base of, of funds to be able to support the operations of the captive. That is typically a minimum of $250,000. It varies based on the amount of risk that you put in the captive. Uh, however, it's going to be a minimum. If you wrote no business in the captive whatsoever, you still got to have the $250,000. So you got to have two fifty dollars plus whatever in premium, be able to comfortably you know, push aside that amount in cash flow every year. Now, we've been talking about 1.2 million. There are expenses associated with this, right? The idea works most efficiently at a full million two of low loss ratio business. But I, I don't, there's two things. I can't afford to put a million two in, or I don't have a million two of retained risk, which is the more common situation. Some folks are like, geez, I got more than enough money to siphon aside. I just don't have enough we can't justify the premium associated with that amount of risk. So what is sort of the minimum threshold? I typically tell folks it's five or six hundred thousand dollars. I'd like to see north of six hundred thousand dollars. If you look at the expenses here, most of them are going to be fixed. There's some slight variant, uh, variable expenses, but even at say three hundred thousand dollars of premium, you're saving taxes. It's just not going to be material to you. People don't want to go through this exercise to save fifteen grand a year in taxes. All right, it's just not. It's not. So at 600,000, suddenly you're saving 150 to $200,000 a year. If you get up to a million two, it can be 350 to $400,000. So at that point, it's material. So if you can find a minimum of 600,000, that's when we say it probably makes sense for you. Go ahead. So, so you've got a million dollars of underwriting premium here, under, uh, underwriting income. Yep. If you can never take that out ah. of you never get the tax benefit. Because it's just a timing issue similar to the large cap. Well, Almost correct. So yeah, and I leave that to the end to see who picks up on the fact that I tried to pull that, throw that one by you. But this, this tax benefit is permanent as long as it stays in the captive. Now, let's say five years down the road, we've got $4 million. We've been wildly successful. We've got capital and surplus, all these retained earnings float in there. Well, that's all well and good, but if I can't get my grubs on it, it's of no use to me. Money would come out in the form of a dividend, which would be subject to the um, qualified dividend rate, which is significantly lower than the ordinary income rate. So there are some unique tax issues here in that what is your corporate tax rate? What is your, if it's a sub S or an LLC and it's, you know, there's someone who's actually pushing 50% tax rate, that looks a lot better because it's going to come out at say 22, 23%. Um, so that is the, the way the money comes out is it going to come out pay a loss or it's going to come out as a dividend or you shut the whole thing down as capital gains, but um, same deal. It's going to be at a, a lower threshold. So there is arbitrage there. There's an arbitrage between whatever your tax rate at which you took the deduction and the tax rate at which you're paying when the money comes out. So that's a good question. Thanks. Yeah? Does the fact that you're in a captive affect you in three ways? One, your bank accounts, your commercial accounts, two, your line of credit, and three, your bondability? Um, the bondability is probably more relevant. 
uh, and that is outside of my comfort zone, but you definitely, you don't want to blindly go out and create a captive without talking to those folks who would, um, anything that impacts your balance sheet, if you're taking money out every year, or your income statement, if you're going to take money out every year, if you're going to uh, post two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars of capital somewhere else. Um, you need to talk to those stakeholders to make sure that you know what impact that's going to have. And the bondability is where we see the the most conversations, especially in the, in the construction space. So, hey, am I a strong enough company? No, you're not a strong enough company. If you start diverting a million bucks a year, that's going to have a negative impact. So, you know, keep that in mind. It's a good question. So your bond, you know, those who who help you on the bond side would. Um, be able to answer or have those conversations with the with the carriers. Do's and don'ts. Don't do it just for the tax reasons. Um, there are. He, here's what I see on a, on a daily basis, weekly basis, not daily. Uh, physician calls me up and said, "Hey, hey, I um, I heard I got your your name off the internet. Uh, I want to talk about creating a small captive. Okay, well, what kind of business are you in? What kind of risk do you have? Blah 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 blah. I got plenty of risk." Um, I want to put aside, I can't afford the full million two, I want to put aside maybe $800,000 this year, What's, what do you charge? Immediately I know this is a dead end conversation because this is somebody who's spoken with another consultant who will make anything work. There are some consultants who have never found a company for which a captive didn't make sense. And what that means is, is that they're going to generate whatever nonsense policy, inflate whatever nonsense premium to give their, their client a, um, a good tax break. So this physician, may make, have, uh, you know, a revenue of $2 million a year, a year and bring in a million to a million t uh, five of profit and wants to put, you know, gets taxed up the wazoo, so he wants to, to put aside $800,000. There is no risk there. They're not talking about putting their medical malpractice insurance into their, into their captive, which is their only real risk. They're talking about a bunch of nonsense kind of stuff. That doesn't work, but there are consultants who will make that work. What we're looking at is if you are a... And again, it, it varies for everybody. But if you're a, um, a $50 million construction firm, you got plenty of risk. It may not be a million twos worth of retained risk, but you got plenty of risk. The bigger question is, are you profitable? Do you have cash flow? And is it going to impact your, your bondability? Is that going to have some negative impact elsewhere? If you're a $50 million CPA firm, you may not have enough risk. You got professional liability and very little else. Um, so that may not work. It all depends. We typically say, if you're north of 25 million in revenue, let's have a conversation. Maybe you also don't buy a lot of commercial insurance. We, we, we come across that as well. Um, so it, the discussion can be different for each industry, um, but, but the amount of retained risk is really the driver. So be careful of consultants that say, yeah, we'll make this work. Um, you heard it here. It does not work for everybody. And what, this is not the most conservative tax play in the world. So by going into a small captive, even though your business reasons are really locked up tight, you, there might be a stigma in that you have an 831B captive because 25% of the marketplace is chock full of really bad 831B captives, stuff the IRS would love to shut down and penalize the heck out of. Um, so be aware, the IRS is examining these things. Our goal is to do this as conservatively as possible. We have nothing to gain by taking our brokerage clients and putting them in a risky position. We are not a standalone captive consultant, so um, I think there's some credibility and peace of mind knowing that. Uh, however, it, it, be aware that this it isn't the most conservative move in the world now. If you're if you're comfortable with it, fine. We'll talk about all the pros and cons, uh, but but go in eyes wide open. Anything else? We and more questions can come up after, but. Um, Group captive discussion is much more interesting, so we'll get Jeff up here as soon as we can. Well, thank you. And um, I've got cards back there, but if you need uh, any other contact information, the other the RGF folks in the room can certainly provide that as well. There we go. Great. Thank you for coming back in the second half. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, because my football team doesn't come in the second half, or the first half for that matter. But my college football team and basketball team does show up. Guess which one that is? Michigan State University. 
So, I'm Jeff Welsher. Yes, I am from Detroit, Michigan. And um, my name was the bottom one on there that didn't have all the initials and acronyms next to it. But when I saw that Derek had all those there, I decided to apply the JR, the junior, next to mine so it at least could maybe balance it a little bit. But um, I've been with Marsh 29 years, been in the group captive area for the last 12 years. And uh, we have a bunch of group captive options. And I'm going to talk very generally about group captives today. But they're all, they kind of run in the same principle. And Derek is a great financial solution for a lot of financial planning and stuff. I'm probably more along the lines of an insurance solution. He's got a, there's a bunch of creative things that you can do on his side. More, what we're looking here is an insurance solution for workers' comp, general liability, and auto. Or if you want to just do the comp or the auto or whatever, there's, there's some ways that we can do it. But for the most part, these are for the three casualty lines or any one of the three casualty lines. Again, we're talking about group captives. And just if we talk from 35,000 feet and just what's this all about and why is this maybe better, this slide here is what we'll talk about uh, just here for a, just a second to get an idea of what is the value proposition for a group captive. If we look at the column over on the far left there, this might be how you may, in very general terms, buy your insurance. Here one, if we're looking at work comp, GL and auto, or just again, just the comp or something of that sort, you might pay a half a million in premium and you have 100,000 in losses. Okay, so the carrier is pretty happy with that. The next year, if we're in a typical marketplace, they'll come back with a flat renewal. Year two, flat renewal comes out at 500,000, but you have the unexpected loss here. You have some bad losses or one bad loss in it. I've shown 500,000 in losses, premiums 500. That may drive, depending on what market we're in, that might drive a premium increase or they'll want to increase deductibles, something of that sort, because they paid out a half million in losses, they took a half million in premium, they're looking for some better situation. Okay, so they come back with a slight increase, we'll say in year three, you're back to your normal loss picture. Year four, they give you a slight decrease, normal loss picture, year five, flat. This may be typical to what the industry shows for a lot of clients. This is the way their actuarial numbers work out. So at the bottom, you say five years, you paid 2.6 million in premium. And you had losses of 900,000, as you can see at the bottom of the page there. Loss ratio for the carrier is 34%. They made a lot of money on you. You're a great risk for them, okay? If this is kind of what you see in your situation, this is an ideal client for a group captive because what a group captive is all about is that we take the profits that in the predictable layers of losses, okay, we take the profit out of the premium and we give it back to the insured, the owners of the insurance company. And that's how I'm going to show you how that works. So if you feel in some ways that your insurance company is making money off you in some fashion, um, that's where this becomes a, an ideal play for you in terms of a group captive. What is a group captive? It's an insurance company that provides insurance to us and controlled by its owners. That's the group captive. You will have an equal share in this group captive. And I'll just show you that in a minute. But why, what are the be true benefits to a group captive? Again, we would never expect you to get into a group captive for your work comp auto or GL and pay more money. That's not what it's all about. So we hope that if we work up a premium and do some modeling for you, that you'll see the pay in for the year for the premium is going to be lower. That's a key thing. Then you look at the premium that you paid in and the losses you had and the losses are less, you're going to get some of that money back in the form of a dividend and investment income. So that's why we're saying that there's cost control cost efficiency and cost smoothing over time. That's a key part of this to remember. This is, and you're paying premiums to an, a company that you own a portion of, okay? You'll share in the underwriting profit and investment income. And we're very much into loss control, claims handling, pre and post loss claims management. And again, you're controlling some of your insurance destiny because you're 
you're owning this company. Why are the costs of a group captive lower? There's a couple things here. That the premiums are based on your own loss experience. So it's not dependent on what, what type of return is the insurance company getting in their and their premiums, you know, their investment income. Is it a hard or is it a soft market? We're insulated. We buy very little peer insurance in this, and I'll show you that in a couple slides down here. Then the operating cost. Our fixed cost structure for a group captive is much lower. You know, many of the major insurance companies, they may sponsor a golf tournament. They may do advertising. They have nice buildings in Hartford, Connecticut. A lot of employees and whatnot, compliance officers, things of that sort. We don't have that a high fixed cost structure. That helps, again, keeping our costs down in this insurance company, okay? The barrier to entry is a little bit tough. You know, we, in this particular captive that I'm talking about here, we have 108 members in this group captive. They kind of, to some degree, they treat it a bit like a private club. You know, once they get in, then they don't want to let anybody else in. You know, they want to be able to walk up Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and be able to tee it up in the morning and not have to wait, you know, because there's a thousand members in it. So we, 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 the barrier to entry is a little bit tough here. We look for quality risks. And when I say quality risks, financially pretty solid. The companies like are into pre and post loss claims management. That's, that's, well, they're doing financially, they're pretty strong. We don't necessarily look for people that have zero losses. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mark, you know, I mean, that's a great risk if you have no losses, but we look for people that have predictable losses over a five-year period or over time, more of a predictable loss picture. You know, if you have a, if you have a million dollars of losses for five straight years, that situation would work out extremely well in a group captive as well as somebody that has no losses. And I'll show you that as we get down the road here a little bit, okay? So what happens in a group captive, again, that we, we've taken and we've got what we feel are the best people to run this insurance company, okay? The members have selected these providers to run this, their insurance company. Marsh McLennan does not own this, okay? We did put $120,000 in it 21 years ago when we started up this group captive. We've pulled that money out and, uh, and we now, um, are just an independent contractor on an annual contract. The members make all the decisions on, on this. And uh, so we, the domicile for group captives typically are in the Cayman Islands. There's a reason why the monetary authority down there that, uh, is very favorable to group captives. They understand them. There's less, a little bit less red tape. Um, Pinnacle Actuaries, uh, Springfield, Illinois, does all our actuarial services. PwC is our auditors. Uh, Credit Suisse does our banking. Gallagher Bassett is our third-party administrator for claims. Scotiabank does all our investments. Risk Consultants um, does the safety side. And this particular captive AIG is the fronter and reinsurance on it. Again, I mentioned WorkComp GL and Auto. Various types of captives. I won't go through these right now. Um, these are, this is a graphic that shows the different hard and soft markets we've seen over the last 40-ish years here. Um, we take the volatility out of the marketplace in the hard and soft market when we're talking about group captives. Let me scoot on to a couple here. About the captive here, as I mentioned, that you would be an, an equal owner in a group captive. If you get into a group captive, you will have one share each member, no matter if your premium's 200,000 or your premium's a million dollars. Everybody has one share, one vote. We have operating committee structure. We have two board meetings a year. We have a finance committee, an underwriting committee, and a risk safety committee. That's, that, they, they're the ones that run the captive. You participate in those committees and the decisions that go that are involved in them. Again, we're under Cayman law. Um, you know, we really look for participation from the membership when you're in a group captives, and the membership uh, very involved and helps it grow. If you get in the group captive, nothing's going to change from the standpoint is that you'll still deal with your local office here in Minneapolis. Um, the group captive is the insurance company behind the scenes. So nothing really changes in that, from that standpoint the way you currently have it. You're just going to have a different 
insurance company that's involved in this and the, and the financing mechanisms is where I'm going to get into right now. This is the meat of where you can see where, how this plays out and how you have an opportunity um, to financially benefit from being involved in a group captive. So what we're talking about is we're talking about the primary initial policy. Okay, so if it's workers' compensation, you have statutory work comp policy. Just like you currently have right now, but this will be an AIG policy. Terms and conditions, everything in it will say the, say, um, the exact terms and conditions, or if you want some enhancements that you couldn't get in the standard marketplace, maybe you can get it in this group captive. So you get a work comp policy, GL policy, be a million dollar limit, the auto will be a million dollar limit. So, so far, nothing's different than you currently have it right now. Your umbrella attaches over just like it normally, would you normally have now with your traditional insurance. The interesting thing is, is that we place about 500 in our group captive, we place about 500 umbrellas over all the clients that we have in our group captives as just an offer of benefit to our local offices in the United States. We use two primary in, um, umbrella markets. And when I, when I want to get into the umbrella scene here is a little bit is that if you have a really knowledgeable underwriter with an umbrella carrier, they like to write over somebody that's in a group captive because they know they have skin in the game. They know that they are heavy into claims management and into safety. So many times that it's good to obviously to let your umbrella carrier know, though you're not required to let them know that the reinsurance company is a group captive. They do like to write over it and sometimes will give you favorable pricing on it. That's kind of what we look, try to do when we try to um, you know, use this commodity of, of 500 clients we have in the umbrella to bring the pricing down. Certificates of insurance, we'll say AIG. Okay, so just much like you have in your current certificates, the same umbrella, the same insurance policy is the same. So here's what the difference is right here, is that I've peeled back the onion a little bit and showing that the, the captive is a reinsurance company. Okay, just like Warren Buffett owns a bunch of reinsurance companies, Berkshire Hathaway and the Gen Rees and Swiss Rees and Munich Rees out there. It's a reinsurance company behind the scenes. We reinsure part of AIG providing it the fronting paper. So from zero to 350 is the company that you would own a share of stock in, okay? That doesn't mean that um, you, are in, you take every claim up to 350,000. Okay, so it's a reinsurance company behind. And if this, all of the insurance companies have a reinsurance company, you know, if it's Hartford, they reinsure it out Zurich reinsures part of it out. And the reinsurance company, if you, if you have an insurance policy in place, you could ask your, the, the insurance company you utilize, who is, your, who is reinsuring this? And they'll tell you. It doesn't really matter to you because they're not the guarantor of the claims. The reinsurance company behind the scenes, even though they help pay the claims, if they go away, the guarantor is the fronting carrier. That's why it's important to have A-rated paper because they're the ones that are going to pay the claims down the road. So that's the same case here. If, if this insurance company, this reinsurance company that you own, if all 108 members go away and disappeared or went Chapter 7, AIG is the fronting carrier. They're responsible for making claim payments. But your fronting carrier always is doing the financial research to make sure who they're selling part of the risk off to is a viable concern. So again, peeling back a little bit further, that zero to 350, the light blue that you have uh, ownership in, we break that into two different buckets to determine the premium that you would pay. So when, when you are, the way you're currently right now, Marsh Agency, if they're putting together a uh, submission to go out and find you the appropriate pricing in the marketplace, they put together a very nice uh, um, story about your company and what you do and why it, there's minimal chance for loss and how well the ownership and safety and everything that goes on. They put together a submission. They go out and sell this to Zurich and to Hartford and to AIG and all the insurance companies out there to try to get you the appropriate price. 
So that underwriter gets that nice book, and what the underwriter does is he immediately takes the portion of loss information out of the submission, and he sends that over to his internal actuary at Traveler's Insurance Company, we'll say. And the actuary takes a look at the loss information and goes through and does all the scrubbing of all the data and runs it through his modeling and comes back and says, we expect X amount of losses from this company. He sends that over to the underwriter, says this is what we expect in losses. So the underwriter, and, they might, and that actuary might come back and say for a primary million dollar policy, we expect $500,000 in losses. So what happens is then the underwriter has to look in his underwriting book and says, well, they're in the business of doing X, Y, Z, so I've got to take an add on 1.7. We've got to do their, their um, we've got to cover our heat, light, water, rent, so we've got to tack on X, Y, Z, and we do this really crazy thing in the United States of America. We want to make a profit, so we've got to tack on this. So that expected $500,000 of losses now comes back and they say, okay, we're going to charge you $850,000 in premium with the expectation that they're going to pay out a half a million dollars in losses over a five-year period. So that's the way traditional insurance company does. Here's the deal with group captives that starts to get the differentiation and why the price is lower on this. What we do is we care about the loss projection for what we call here the frequency layer. So again, we're gonna come up with a price for each of these three layers in a group captive. And this is the way that, you know, there's probably out there 30 to 40 really quality group captives, be it heterogeneous or homogeneous group captives that are out in the United States right now. And they run basically with this exact same model. Okay, so the frequency fund is the only thing we get a loss projection for. So if we're competing against that $850,000 in premium deal where it's expected to be $500,000 in losses, here's how we would stack up. So we are gonna come up with a loss pick from zero to $125,000. That's what our actuary, Pinnacle Actuaries, is gonna come back with is a loss pick in that frequency layer. So they might come back and say it's $400,000 is what we expect to have in losses from zero to 125. And then we take about 30% of that loss pick in the frequency fund and we charge that for the severity fund. So if it was 400,000, then we take about 100, 120,000, put that in the severity fund. So that's the cost for those first two layers that takes you up to 350. Well, you say, why don't you just do an actuarial pick like the traditional insurance company does? The reason why is because the actuaries have a hard time predicting the losses the further you go up. There's very, there becomes less and less credibility the further you go up that tower of a million dollars. They do a loss pick by a layered analysis, and there's a high confidence level in that zero to 100, zero to 150-ish. Okay, why it gets tougher the further you go up because you now, the larger the claim gets, you get into jurisdictions that you gotta look at how conservative or liberal they are in their court systems. You gotta look at case precedents. They start lowering up the harder it gets. You get a bad deposition or something like that and then you, you don't have much, you know, you're paying out and everything like that. So there's less credibility. So we say, let's charge what we know for where we have the highest degree of credibility. Let's use a formula to come up with the rest, okay? So that's where we take the 30%. And then our group, typically group captives fixed costs structure is somewhere between 31 and 40%. Ours is 32.4%. Um, in it. So what we charge for the dark blue portion, the aggregate protection, the specific protection is 32.48. So kind of what I just ran through here is popping the numbers in. We're gonna charge here $746,000 for this example that I've worked through. So 746, this is not uncommon. This compares to the guaranteed cost of 850. So you say, okay, you know, that's a, the delta on that's around $100,000. You know, I, I like that, okay? 
you know, I mean, hundred thousand dollars less. Not typically a, uncommon. There are some nuances to this. There's some downside risk and there's some upside benefit to this. So that, you know, with the fact that you can get dividends back, okay, a little bit of the trade-off is the downside risk, and I'm going to show you how that kind of plays out. So if, again, this is again just keep in mind that how that traditional work insurance works up their premium of 850 in this example, we come up with 746. Now, um, this light blue is a variable component here. So this is what you have the opportunity to get back with a positive loss picture. Okay, so you have good loss experience. Good loss experience is having losses less than $500,000, what the actuary projects. If you have losses less than that, you're gonna get that money back, plus you'll get um, the investment income. Now when I say investment income in this, we take, we have 32 group captives that we pool our money together with that we're involved in and run. We put that money with Credit Suisse, and here, here's the situation is that we have 1.9 billion in assets under management with the, in this, and of those 32 captives, we have one member of each captive that sits on the board of the investors fund, okay? And um, we're into capital preservation, okay, because we have to pay losses with that money. 50% is in fixed, 40% in his equity, and 10% is in creative alternatives. Since 1994, when we started up the investors fund, we've returned 6.2%. So your money that you, that you're, this, the variable component that's invested is not sitting totally idle. Now I realize that, you know, I'd like you guys to hold that yourself in your company because I'm sure your internal rate of return is greater than 6.2%. But again, you're paying premium dollars here. And the, and the hope is that you'll do better through the enhanced safety aspects that you can get, the, get that money back plus the investment income. <clears throat> we ask our members to focus on, this, on your frequency losses. Again, this is the only part that the actuary comes up with. So control your frequency losses and it's gonna drive your premium down each year. If you control those frequency losses, and they come in less than 400, you're gonna get the dividends back. The reason why we say control the frequency losses is because frequency breeds severity. So the more frequency losses, ultimately what's gonna happen is a, a severity loss is gonna pop out of that. Okay, so we say control frequency and life is going to be good in a group captive or in traditional insurance, it's gonna be good as well. Because if you end up having a good year and your losses are less than 400 and we go through and do an actuarial pick next year, they might come back and say, this number next year is gonna be 380 because of the fact you had a good loss year. So then we take 30% of 380, that's gonna drive that down to 90. Then we take 32.48% of that and that 246 now becomes 225. So your premium next year is $75,000 lower because you controlled your frequency losses. It's all, again, controlling frequency. That's where you have skin in the game. And it's a more predictable, as I mentioned, it's a more predictable layer of loss. This is not, and this is not. So what we ask you to do is have skin in the game in here. So what happens is you're on the hook for your losses from zero to 125. If this isn't enough, if 400 isn't enough and you had a bad frequency year, Okay, the shortfall in this, we have the ability to come back and bill you for the shortfall. If you have 450,000 in losses, this is the downside risk. So you put in 400, but you had 450, $50,000 of that, you're gonna get an invoice on a three-year installment. We do have an aggregate stop loss. So if this 400 isn't enough, we have the ability to come back and charge you up to another $400,000. So that $400,000 is the downside risk. So the 746 plus 400 is your max worst case situation. But again, that's typically a more predictable loss layer and it's the one that we really want to manage through great claims management and doing the right safety stuff, okay? Severity's harder to predict. You don't get penalized for a if you have $2 million losses in a year, 
it's not going to affect you in a group captive, believe it or not. Financially, where the downside risk falls in the frequency side. Making sense so far? Because if it doesn't, just quite yet, it's going to make a little more sense now. So in this picture that we talked about here, there's one other thing is that we require collateral for what essentially is this A fund, where this number is something you get a bill for down the road if it's not enough. So we require two thirds of that number to post in a letter of credit. Okay, so that's, that's an additional Again, cost is or, uh, it's opportunity loss costs on your uh, cash flow because it might be a hit against your line of credit that you got to post a letter of credit and, and the cost a couple basis points for doing a letter of credit or cash security. If you do cash collateral, it's also in the investor's fund um, so it doesn't sit totally idle. So just recapping the 746 throw a little bit of curve at you is this frequency layer, we also call it an A fund severity, the shock loss layer is B funds reinsurance. So it's 400, 100, 246 adds up. So here's, this is where it's all gonna kick in. We're getting close to the, uh, getting very close to the uh, red zone here. So uh, one thing of that, 246, just, to, just take a look here. Those are the fixed costs or the sunk costs. The first two go to AIG. They get $95,000, and if this is your risk, they get $95,000 for to pay claims above 350, or if you have an aggregate breach. The issue, the policy, and all the stuff that goes with it, they get 21,000. So if you notice there, they get $116,000. That's what AIG gets. Everything else is outside of the world of insurance. When I said if the market turns hard, the only thing that really can turn hard in this is those top two numbers. So if you can see there, there's about 15%. So if rates go up 20% because of a hard market, of your 746, what's really at risk is just those two. Because the next two items, premium tax and FET, you pay that currently. If you ask your insurance carrier, it's built into your premium. We pay the exact same as the rest of it. It's a, based on state filings, you pay premium taxes. Claims goes to Gallagher Bassett. They will handle your claims from cradle to grave. And we are the largest, the largest client Gallagher Bassett has, bar none, in North America, is what we have with our 32 group captives. We use it all. Our managed care rates, um, we use their Coventry system f for all the stuff we do in managed care to get the losses back to the, get it settled at the most socially responsible outcome. They do a great job on it. They have panel rates for use of all their doctors. All their, uh, um, all their medical people that are, if you go out, you know, and your employee gets injured, most likely there, you'll get the paneled rates because they have thousands and thousands of uh, contracts across the country for managed care. Um, risk control, that's, they have uh, safety, in words, we have three different providers for the pre-loss safety, depending on what's needed. It's as low as 110 bucks an hour. It can be as high as 300 bucks an hour, depending on the sophistication of what you need. You can also use, if you're satisfied with your Marsh agency folks in loss control, you can utilize them. But in this example, there's $7,500 built in um, for, built into your premium for safety. Then the next two, the, the, that goes to the, basically to our offshore Marsh Cayman office, and then the, other expenses go for uh, the local offices. The variable expense, the 1% there goes to pay PricewaterhouseCoopers um, for doing their annual audit and their semi-annual management statement. We also have two board meetings a year offshore. Um, all of the meals and meeting rooms and coffee and all that stuff comes out of that variable component. You have to pay for your airfare and the hotel. We book our hotels three years in advance. We use all the same group captives at the same venues, so we typically get extremely good rates, but though they're in the Caribbean, the rates are still typically high, but we can get it lower than you can get in this standard going through and, and going to the Caribbean. Um, okay, so here we go. So if, those, if this 746,000, we're getting to the end here, I'm gonna run through quick, three quick loss examples. So, so far we're saying 746 versus 850 if that's our example. 
but I got that $400,000 downside risk that I don't know if I want to deal with that. So let's take a look at how all this is going to work out here and see if this makes some sense. First year in the captive, upper right hand corner in the black bar, says here in the black banner, it says you have, let's just say you have 190,000 of total claims. And all those claims are smaller claims, meaning they're all less than 125,000. They all close less than 125,000. So you had no shock losses, nothing above 125. 190,000, so if you, it's pretty simple here. So at the end of the first year, you're accounting, you put in 400, you put in 100, you put in 246. You had 190 claims, 210 is your remaining balance. That's pretty straightforward. So the accounting on this is you're gonna get back a dividend of 335,000 on the 746. So your insurance costs essentially are half of what the other guaranteed cost was. This, this is not an uncommon situation, and we can show you going back for 21 years of our group captive, we have you know, obviously all our audited financial statements for every single member, and this is not an uncommon situation. Um, I have an asterisk on that B fund, because I'm gonna come back to something on that. So that first year is pretty simple. You had one of the good loss years, and you're gonna get a nice dividend back, plus the, invest, plus the investment income, yes? It's, it's based on total incurred losses, correct. Okay, second year, that's the outlier year that we looked at uh, at the very start. We have, let's say we have an outlier year here in year two. The banner up in the right. You have your typical frequency losses of 190,000. I use that same number just for sake of simplicity, but you have your typical smaller losses, they add up to 190,000, but you have one severity loss. Okay, so what happens is you pay in 746 and you have 1,190,000 in losses. So what happens in this situation? Well, let's take care of the frequency losses. We saw this from the first year, back out, back out 190 out of the 400, so that's 210 remaining. So you got 210 in your A fund, you got 100 remaining, and we gotta take care of the million dollar claim now. So as you know, the million dollar claim goes all the way up the tower above the 350 or 650 of that million dollar claim. 650 is paid for by AIG. Okay, so if you remember when I showed you that, you paid them $116,000 and they're gonna pay on your behalf 650. So, you know, they took a beating on you but when you start to get into the law of probability and actuarial numbers, we have 108 members, and the Monte Carlo probability says that we're gonna expect seven to 10 members of our 108 members to have a year of maybe where they breached into AIG. The economy of scale buying is that those seven to 10 members that breached that, and we pay in $4 million in that layer, they, still have a 34% loss ratio in that because the economy of scales, so it doesn't hurt you at renewal next year that you had a million dollar claim. What goes into the rating formula is zero to 125. That's all we do an actuarial pick for. The part above 125 does not go into the rating formula. Early on I said there's a smoothing effect because what happens is that we only use zero to 125 because the rest of it gets risk transferred off, and I'm gonna show you how that goes. So, 650 of it's taken care of by AIG. So 350 of it comes from the group captive. The captive pays for zero to 350, and of course, we look to your accounting to take care of it. So, from here to here of that, of that 350, Here's 125, so we apply 125 to the, that 210 remaining. So now you have 85 remaining. So we've taken care of 125 of the zero to 350. So now we gotta come up with 225, which is the distance from here to here. You put in 100, so we apply 100. So we're short, from this distance to here, we're short 125. So what we do is we look down, do we have any money remaining? And you have 85 remaining. 
So we take the 85 out, you have zero. We apply the 85 here. We're now short 40. You have no money left in the B fund. You have no money left in the A fund. We're short $40,000. So this is where what we do is we risk share this to the 108 members. They do not write a check for it. What they do is it comes out of the profitability in the B fund for all the members. And depending on your size in the captive, you take on, if you got 0.0002% of the premium in the captive, that's how much you would take of that. So you got 108 members sharing in that $40,000 and it comes out of their B fund profit. So when we go back, I'm going backwards here. I said in this, in this first example, I have that asterisk up by the 100,000. Realistically, you're probably not gonna get back the full 100. You paid in 746. We say let's budget 5% of your funding to go towards others' losses. So let's say around 20,000 of that 100 would be used to help in others' losses. So instead of getting back 335, you might get back 305, 310 something of that sort, because you had a profitable year there, you helped those seven to 10 members that had that bad loss year. Our numbers expect you, one out of five years, to be in a situation where you create risk sharing like I'm showing in year two. Four out of the five years, you're profitable and you give a small portion of your B funds. When we look at a five-year picture, you created 40,000 of risk sharing and you helped 10 to 15,000 in four of the five years of others and it comes out very close to zero risk absorption versus risk sharing. So the accounting for year two is paid in 746, you had a million one in losses. End of story. That's it, you paid in 746. No downside risk, as I said, on catastrophic losses. Yes? Just to clarify, when you said 5% of that 100 grand, yeah. it was 20, it's 5%, so it'd be 5 grand only, right? 5% of your, actually, your gross written premium. So in this example, uh, we say budget 5% of the 746. Okay, now, what we do is we will show you that we, go back to the 21 years and show you what the actual is. It, it goes, I mean, I think our lowest year, we've had like 1.9%. Our highest year um, is, I want to say it's maybe 5%, 5.5% in there. But we average somewhere between 3 and 5%. So it's 5% of the total amount of money. Yes, right, yeah. Now, um, the key thing on the, um, this that you have to have, there is a, an accelerated tax benefit to this, so we have to show some risk sharing or risk shifting in a group captive, okay, to be able to have the accelerated tax because 100% of this premium, even though you haven't had losses yet, is tax deductible. If you're coming from a deductible plan into a group captive, that's where you're gonna see a little bit of benefit on the tax side. If you're coming from a guaranteed cost, it's, it's gonna be neutral on that, okay? Last, last loss example. <clears throat> this is where we're going to show you the downside risk in this. You have year three, you have 550 total claims and they're all less than 125. So all of the losses fall in this layer right here. You put in $400,000. You have 550 in losses. This is where we say we got to control frequency. So you do the accounting on this, 400 minus 5, you're short 150. We do not go up and take out of this layer here. Okay, this again is kind of what we call the profit zone risk sharing pool. So this is where you're going to get a three year installment for that shortfall of 150. So if you paid in 746, You paid in 746 plus the 150, okay? Here's the accounting on it. You're gonna get a dividend back 
for the B fund because you didn't have any losses above the 100. Some of the stuff that you can do to analyze if this is the right thing for you is we can model your numbers. So we'll come up with the premium. And then what we can do is we can also work up, had you been in the captive the last five years, we can say exactly what you would have paid had you been in the captive the last five years based on your historical loss experience. And we give you the exact investment income and the exact risk sharing that you would have had historically. So we can predict what the last five years was and compare that to how you did historically. So that's what we can do in the modeling. There's no cost for that. If you're serious about um, the group captive, we're happy to invest that in, uh, time into that to help you through this. Can you meet with Gallagher Bassett on claims handling, um, see what we do in the area of claims, um, talk to any of the members that we have in the group captive, um, see our financial statements, talk to our Cayman office. Um, we have these safety round tables twice a year, central in the United States, where we share in a bunch of safety best practices. We have attorneys come in, we have different people do speaking engagements. You can attend a board of directors meeting. A lot of stuff that you can do to see what this is all about. I've included on everybody's table, I'm not taking these back with me to lighten my luggage, but here's an annual report of one of our group captives, this particular one that I talked about here. You can see what this is all about on the group captive. Um, and the dividends that we've given back historically. Um, you, they do a spotlight on some of our members in there. You get an idea of what um, the group cap, if you can get a feel for the personality of it by looking at our annual report there that's in front of it. So, um, yes? So you talked about a five-member uh, committee that decides whether you get in. <coughs> but if you're in, do you, are there people who get kicked out of the cap? Yeah. The cap Great, great question. Um, I like that when I get that question. <laughs> They're giving some good thought to it. What we do is we have those committees that we run, those three committees at a board meeting, I said, the underwriting committee, the finance committee, and the safety committee. So what happens is that that's where we, we have a board book we put out twice a year. It's about three inches thick with all kind of analytics. That's what we get kind of paid to do in those numbers there. And then we send that out in advance of the board meeting and the members go through that and tear that apart and see what's going on. And then we get in the committee meetings and every member is assigned a password code that's there. So you might be member number F0032697. Nowhere is it gonna say the name of your company in the board book. So when you're going through and you're looking at the analytics of everything that goes on, you might get to the safety section and you might see that somebody's frequency rate has gone up quite a bit the last five years. Member number, da da da, frequency rate's gone up. We notice they also it has their attendance in the workshops, how many meetings they've had with their safety control people. So if things are deteriorating on the safety side in their loss picture, they could go on the watch list meaning that we'll put together a 60-day plan. Nobody will know what, what, who that is. You might be sitting in the safety committee and you know, you're looking at those analytics and saying, yeah, those aren't very good, yep. So you make a motion, I think that we should put them on the watch list. Lo and behold, that person is sitting right next to you. You didn't know that, you happened to have dinner with them last night and you, know, you raise your hand, let's put them on the watch list. And that person most likely will raise their hand too because they don't want to stick out. But, so they'll go on the watch list. Have we ever kicked anybody out? 21 years, we've kicked one person out of it. Interestingly, it was uh, from Detroit, Michigan, the client, and they were tied to the, uh, kind of somewhat to the construction issue. They did heavy machinery equipment, a cat dealer, and they were financially struggling and they were up for sale. They ended up being bought by Volvo and whatnot, but uh, they, we moved them out for various reasons. They were headed in the wrong direction, so. Long answer to yours, um, so we do have watch lists. We do do all the analytics on that, very important to us. But we like to think that we've done all the right scouring in advance to make sure we have the right kind and quality of members, high character people and whatnot um, before we get them in. Yes? So the company that you picked out of, the companies you put on the watch list, do you still, even if you keep them out, their liability is still retained by the captain? Or do you charge them some kind of fee? How does that work? What happens is that, think about this, that they, let's say that we move somebody out, okay? They um, have letters of credit, which is financial, as I mentioned, I used member-to-member -member security, so we have letters of credit to protect us. They also pre-fund their losses. So our collateral position for each member is 
very secure. We do retain that, that liability is in the captive, even though they're out, they are still on the hook for that, for all of the contractual stuff that goes into this. They're, they're still on the hook for it. I mean, I have never seen, I've run two offshore captives, I've been involved in many for, as I said, for 12 years. Um, I've never seen where a captive has been burned by a member that's gone chapter seven or been moved out. And they don't see it because we're very proactive in this. We don't, we're not reactive to it. I mean, because of the fact that, um, you know, we just try to do the best job we can. And we have the fiduciary responsibility to make sure this captive's done, done well. And um, so we, it, it isn't one day we wake up and it's the way it is. And we stay on top of those things. And you see the numbers and you will see the numbers of everybody that's in the captive. You will see their financial performance, each individual member. Again, you will have no idea who it is. There's millions of numbers in these books, but it's, it's um, you don't get blindsided on it. Again, because we have a pre and post loss safety and claims people assigned to every account in it that stays and works well to, to enhance that area. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, somebody leaves the captive. Do you have people leave the captive? It, um, interesting is that we have probably 3,000 group captive members, and we have a 99% retention rate because of the fact that um, there's no fat built into this. You know, everything's distributed back to the membership. Every penny is accounted for. It's fully transparent. You review the numbers. When somebody leaves the captive, I'll tell you what we've lost it for, and this is not built into the 99%, is when somebody gets acquired. That's, that's what happens. And they get acquired by somebody much bigger that has million dollar retention, so they get rolled in. We've had situations where somebody's acquired somebody, and when they're going through the analyst trying to figure out what they got, we've had actually had where they've joined the captive because they've liked it, and we've had some that, well, okay, we'll leave that in, and we've had some that have just said, no, we're, we're rolling this up. So when they go out, mm -hmm. they've paid on total incurred claims up front. What future liability do they have as they've left? Only if the reserves would be underrated and go up in future years. Well, we, again, there's a cash pool that they have for each of those individual years. The, each individual year stands on its own. So if you had a really good year in year one and you're in a bad year, we can't go back. That defies gap accounting. We can't do that. So they stand on their own. If they're short on their funding and it's in that frequency layer, they'll get an installment for that. And if they don't, then we tap the letter of credit. Okay. So that's the extent of their of a, a, of a member that has left. That's the extent of their future liability to the yep. captive. Yes. And what happens is we try to close out an underwriting year five years out. We sell off the liability when we close it. Okay, so typically if their last year that they were in the captive was five years ago, everything's closed out. We give them back their share of stock plus the investment income, do all the documents to close them out, and they're off the hook. But it's, if I can put it in terms of insurance, it's like leaving a deductible plan. It's no different than that. But the, the good thing is, is that Insurance companies typically will go six, seven, eight years of holding collateral and going through this stuff. We sell off and close everything out in five years and it's done, end of underwriting year. Good questions. Any other thoughts on it? Okay. Well, I think, uh, Toby, is there any other uh, comments on it? That's, that's the extent, obviously, uh, I'll be around Derek will be around or whatever, and you can get hold of any of us down the road as well. I really appreciate everybody coming out. Hopefully you've met your expectations. I know Toby said there's gonna be some survey that's gonna go out tomorrow, and, um, and go from there. Again, we thank you very much for coming out here.